Welcome to Disciple Dojo. I had such a great discussion today with Dr. Beth Stovell. She is a, a Old Testament professor, biblical studies professor, and we we just we we nerded out. It was awesome. We talked about Ezekiel, my favorite of the major prophets, and then we talked about the minor prophets. Both of those are books that she teaches and does work in regularly and is is um, a good go to. Both of those are areas of scripture that she is intimately familiar with, having taught on Ezekiel and the minor prophets. So I'm excited for this discussion. It's just so cool to be able to have world-class scholars here in the dojo and introduce you to them. We talked all about the whole reason we do this is not just to introduce you to specific scholars and to put their work on your radar, but to also encourage you in your diving into the world of the Bible and into particularly intimidating parts of it, which the Minor Prophets and Ezekiel are both very intimidating books if you're approaching them for the first time and don't really know what to expect. We had a great discussion. Uh, I just I can't wait for you guys to watch it. The only reason that we're able to do any of this, to, to have the equipment to make this possible and the channel to get it out to you is because of those of you who support this ministry, particularly by subscribing and enabling notifications when you do. That's that's just huge for us. And we are just so thankful for all of you coming up on. I think as of this video, we're hit, about to hit twenty four thousand um, which is just phenomenal. But our goal is to continue growing and, and to reach so many more people and to get these type of discussions out into the public consciousness as much as we're able to. So by clicking subscribe and by enabling notifications, by leaving comments, by liking the video, by sharing Disciple Dojo resources, what you're doing is helping build the momentum of this snowball that we've created here at Disciple Dojo. Another way you can tangibly help us is to become a monthly donor. We, we are a nonprofit ministry. We rely on primarily donor giving every month to do the ministry here at Disciple Dojo. So take a look at our website, think it over, pray it over. If it's something you think, yeah, I want to support this. I want to help get this type of teaching and these type of resources out to a wider audience. We would love for you to become a monthly Dojo donor. It, it can be $5 a month. It can be $5,000 a month. You know, if you're a philanthropic billionaire watching this video by some chance and you're looking to somewhere to put your money. But seriously, no, even even just a little bit, a lot of people giving a little bit. Uh, it really helps keep this thing going. We don't we don't have a Patreon. We don't do tiered memberships here on YouTube. We don't put out extra content. You can pay a little money and get it. That's I, that's too much like peddling the gospel. What we do is simply say, here are all our resources. We're going to keep doing it. If you want to help make sure that we're able to keep doing it, consider donating to the ministry. That's it. Leave the rest up to the Lord. Okay, I'm excited. Sit back and enjoy this discussion on Ezekiel and the Minor Prophets with Dr. Beth Stovell. Welcome to Disciple Dojo. We are here with Dr. Beth Stovell. And Beth and I connected at SBL um, this past year. We were able to have dinner together and chat some. And I said, I want you to come on Disciple Dojo. I don't care what you talk about. Let's just get you in here. <laughs> and so awesome. she's gracious enough to be here today. I'm excited. We're going to talk. We're going to talk some prophetic stuff, the prophets, um, and maybe a few other things. But Beth, it's it's great to see where are you coming from and how are you doing. Like, what part of the country are you in, and and what do you? What I, I assume you're in your office. So tell tell just I tell am. viewers who you are and what you do, and and um, anything else you think is pertinent. Yeah. So um, so I teach at Ambrose University. I teach at the seminary portion of Ambrose University here in Calgary, Alberta. So I'm in the Great White North mm. in Canada. Um, but I'm originally American, so I'm like an American Canadian. Um, and, uh, so I teach, I teach our seminary students. I'm a professor of Old Testament. Um, but my background is actually old and new. And so I kind of work in the relationship between the two. And so I teach our Old Testament courses, our Hebrew courses, the biblical theology kinds of courses. Mm -hmm. And I also run some of our programs. I'm an administrator as well. So yeah. that's, uh, 
that's what I'm up to here. Um, you and you're hats. getting to see my office yes. um, with my artwork and many, many books. So <laughs> <laughs> I can relate to both of those as someone whose undergrad degrees were in art and as someone who has many, many books. So <laughs> kindred yeah, spirits. Actually, I was, I had an undergrad degree or, and a, one of my grad degrees in English literature. So we actually have a bookcase at home that is like the literature bookcase. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, my, we have a, a lot of them all over the place. We just can't get enough of them. So. Yeah. You got to keep them separate. You have your theology, your Bible nerd stuff, and then your literature nerd stuff. And, um, I have across from me, my comic book nerd stuff. So a bunch of hardcover oh, comic books, nice, Bible stuff. Nice. And then the other room is where I keep my, you know, uh, non Bible literature. So it's, it's good to talk with a fellow bibliophile and, and an old Testament <laughs> scholar. Um, I, I initially, when I stepped down from my role as a, I was pastor of discipleship after I graduated seminary and my next step after stepping down, I did that for five years. And and I mm -hmm. was thinking, I think I'm going to probably go do a PhD in, in Hebrew Bible or Old Testament or biblical mm -hmm. theology. And, and I, it, that never materialized. God had other plans. Uh, I realized very clearly now that he had other plans and, and Disciple Dojo came from that, but mm -hmm. it's, tell me how, I just like when I talk to other people, especially people who are interested in Old Testament, especially, I want to say, I mean, let's be honest, like there are not a lot of women scholars in the field of not just biblical scholarship, but particularly Old Testament scholarship. So I'm always fascinated when I talk to someone like you or Carmen, mm -hmm. some of the other guests that we've had on here that, that focus on Hebrew Bible, especially that are women. How, what what was what got what drew you that way, um, and what captured you or attention in your heart about teaching the Bible and particularly the Hebrew Bible? Yeah, so I mean, I mentioned that I started out teach you know studying English literature. Mm -hmm. I was also doing classics, and uh, so I was studying kind of like ancient Greek and Latin and kind of that side of things in my undergrad. And I went on to do my master's degree at Regent College um, in Vancouver. It's how I ended up in Canada. And when I was doing that, um, I was actually doing a whole other track. I was doing spiritual theology, English literature. I, I thought I was going to be an English professor. Um, and then one of my professors um, who'd had me for the New Testament courses that I took with the seminary mm -hmm. stopped me in the hallway and said, I need to talk to you. So I went to his office and he said, I believe God wants you to be a biblical scholar. And my first response was, does God know what degree I'm taking? Because <laughs> that's not the degree I'm in. Awesome. And, uh, but you know, he reflected, uh, his name is Rick Watts. He's, he's an awesome old in the new old New Testament and the new Testament professor. Mm -hmm. Um, and he reflected back to me things about myself, which I hadn't seen about myself. Oh, um, nice. so my maiden name is Moskowitz. I'm Jewish. Uh -huh. Um, and so I grew up with the old Testament and the story, that big story of, of uh, Judaism mm -hmm. and as a part of what it meant to be Christian, my dad was a Messianic Jew. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I had always thought in terms of the Old Testament and the New Testament and their relationship. And so when I ended up uh, kind of getting in these courses, I would ask all these questions. Of, well, okay, how does this relate to this in the Old Testament? And what is it? How does it look like this? And right. Um, and so I had this passion that was already almost like built into who I was, mm -hmm. um, that I was not doing directly in my English literature. And so, uh, when Rick suggested this to me, I went to my husband who had only recently gotten married to and said, um, Hey, you know how we thought I was about to end my degree and I'm almost done with my thesis in a different field. Um, maybe I'm going to change. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought he would just say, uh, no, because <laughs> he's a student too. So right. I thought we wouldn't have the money. And, and he was like, um, actually I've had this sense from God for a while mm -hmm. that I, you know, that he, he, my husband was like working in theology. He's like, I couldn't imagine us teaching and you teach the Bible and I teach theology. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying to God, Beth's not doing that. That's not her discipline. And he's like, but God says yes. And so, uh, so it's actually just really uh, exciting to think about what that would look like then for me. So yeah. because Rick um, did the use of the old and the new, he taught both Old Testament and New Testament classes. So mm -hmm. in my head, I sort of just assumed that's what all biblical professors did. I didn't realize there was a divide generally between the two. And so I just got excited about all of it. I just wanted to study and to learn more about God through the Bible. 
And I was so excited about how to do that with a literary angle. Like how does, how does we think about it in terms of metaphors and, and and what is God doing with that? And so Mm. uh, that's ended up being what I did my dissertation on. Um, And that's ever since I just, I love, I love thinking about that. Um, I will say as a woman in the field, that was challenging because um, I don't come from a home where, um, where women are supposed to do that. Mm. Um, I come from a context in Texas where women aren't supposed to uh, right. teach the Bible. Right, and right. so, um, in, in really in any capacity to adults. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was a big moment mm. of talking with God and really questioning that. And I think um, I've now had, you know, 20 years of processing that. But um, but I think uh, I'm really thankful I was obedient but it wasn't an easy, it isn't, it hasn't been easy to be a woman in the field. Yeah. Oh no. And I, so, yeah, I can. And, and just from the female scholar friends that I have and talking with them and, and hearing some of the challenges and some of the things that, you know, that us guys in the field wouldn't think about. Um, it's really cool. It's cool that one, it's cool that you had a professor encourage you and see your gifting and recognize it. I think that's huge. And two, that your husband was on board, you know, the idea of the, the two being one and family, like, mm-hmm. like I, we, I said, a guest and I were talking recently about if people are considering seminary, what are some things to think about? And one of them was like, is your spouse called to seminary? Because yeah. if you're called, they are called if you're married, it's a joint calling and same with ministry. Absolutely. So keeping, it, it's just really neat to see that teamwork dynamic and and, and that won't satisfy people who are like, ah, oh, but you have to be undercovering and you can only teach children and you can't, you know, but nothing's going to satisfy that if, if you're approaching the text with that hermeneutic. Um, but seeing, you know, the fruit of what you're doing and, and the content and the scholarship that's being put out, I, I think it's awesome. We had, you had sent me um, a, a link to, you wrote an article, our friend, uh, Dr. Drew Johnson is involved with the um, Hebraic thought. And you sent me an article you had written on that about Ezekiel and uh, mm-hmm. hope amid grief in Ezekiel. And so I wanted to start talking with you because Ezekiel is, um, when I say Ezekiel, those of my viewers that are jujitsu people, their ears perk up, they immediately think of a sleeve choke, and um, which is great because that's my favorite technique. But I'm not talking about that Ezekiel. <laughs> I'm talking about <laughs> the one that normal people think about, which is the biblical book, Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is one of those books that is a magnet for lunatics. Um, <laughs> and, and it's like Revelation. It's like the Revelation of yeah. the Old Testament. Ezekiel and Daniel may be tie for that honor, yeah. I think. But but because it's so strange, it's so weird, it's so crass um, in places and and mm-hmm. vulgar. But I, it it is it's of the of the major prophets. It's definitely my favorite. And so I wanted to ask you about Ezekiel. And just to start off, how would you, if somebody says, hey, I, you know, they're, maybe they're a new believer or they've never really read through the Bible and they're like, um, Dr. Sowell, I'm excited. I'm going to start reading Ezekiel. What would your like, okay, before you set off on this journey, here are some right. things to know. What would you tell them? Well, I think I'd tell them a few things. One, if you've read Isaiah or another book like that in the past and you're expecting Ezekiel to go back and forth between these beautiful pictures of blessing and then these warnings, but then you get blessing again, you're not going to get that with Ezekiel. Ezekiel, the first half of the book is is almost completely a deep dive into really intense pain, grief, punishment, mm. violence. It's very hard. Um, and you know, you really have to go 33 chapters in ish with, you know, just like one or two gleaming moments, but really right. 33 chapters in, and then you finally start to see some turning towards a more hopeful vision. And that is different than most of the other, most of the other things we read that are prophets and what we expect in a prophet. And so I would encourage people to start with the awareness that that's going to happen and that there's going to be some things in it that are going to feel very strange. Ezekiel does a lot of things we call synax, these activities where he does things in his body to represent something God is trying to say. And those things he does with his body are weird. Right. They're bizarre. (laughs) And so, I mean, that includes, you know, everything from um, like, you know, cutting off his hair in a weird way, like with, and like 
pulling off his beard and mm. laying on his side for a really long time. And uh, the one that I always like to talk to my students about is like eating food over poop, basically. <laughs> yeah. um, and he's really upset. He's like, I don't want to eat food that was food that was cooked over poop. <laughs> and I mean, like, and it's it is very, it's a very strange in those ways. And, mm-hmm. and and again, if you're familiar with other prophets, some of it's similar to what we see in Isaiah or Jeremiah or other, you know, or the minor prophets, but some of it's really not. Right. right. And when it's not, that can that can be, you know, a little bit hard. Mm-hmm. Um and I think, but what I also say to people is that understanding that Ezekiel is writing in the middle of the worst experience that Israel ever had, Mm -hmm. that he's in the middle of the pain and the loss and the suffering. And he's writing in it. Mm -hmm. Whereas Isaiah is writing with an anticipation that that's going to come. And Jeremiah also is an an almost like anticipation of it coming. Mm -hmm. Ezekiel starts in it. And so it's not surprising then that the first part of the book would be full of pain and struggle and right. violence because that's what he's been in the midst of. Right, right. And if we think of it that way, I think actually it can be kind of hopeful even in the beginning part mm-hmm. because then in some ways it, I find it to be hope, hopeful in that sense, even in the beginning, mm-hmm. because it voices what sometimes we're afraid to voice right. that experience of hurt and violence. And, and so um, some people think of Ezekiel as, as like a form of trauma literature, like expressing trauma mm. um, in the first half and then survival literature in the second half, like right. kind of. Um, and I think that to me is really helpful because then you're not coming to it. Like what the heck is happening and why is this so grim? And mm. what do I do with that? Right. Um, so, yeah. So I tend to tell that to people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Those let me, let me ask you, where do you think his, um, the fact that he w- was training to become a priest and then was mm. taken out of the land before, as far yeah, as we yeah. know, before ever really serving, how do you see, or do you see that his priestly background being woven into the things either God tells him to do or God says through him or the symbols that God shows him. Um, do you see that? Does that play a role? Because he's the only, I believe he's the only prophet that was a priest that I know of. I mean, off the top of my as head. As far as we know. Yeah. As far as we know, he's the only prophet that's a priest and is part of the prophetic literature. So right. we have other prophets who are priests who are referenced in prophetic literature or in the historical books. Right. But he's right, the right. only one that is like a prophetic book that we have a book of. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, he's very interesting. Um, I think for a few things that I come out of that, I mean, he has a strong emphasis on holiness. Mm-hmm. And um, and because and his his emphasis on holiness in part comes from that desire to return to holiness. One of the things that we see in Ezekiel is the removal of the temple is such a central part of the book. And if you're a priest without a temple, that's one of the situations like priests are supposed to have temples. They're supposed to serve in temples. Yeah. Right. So if the thing you are supposed to serve in has been removed because it's been so great, like the unholiness, Mm -hmm. the lack of holiness is so great then it's not surprising that a lot of his depictions and his responses are connected to this desire to draw back to holiness. Right. Um, and so I think, I think that's one of the big things. The other thing is, um, whereas someone like Isaiah uses a lot of Exodus imagery, um, Ezekiel uses a lot of Leviticus. Mm -hmm. Um, so we get a lot of this priestly language, like the language of that part of the old Testament, um, comes over and over and over again. Like he quotes sections from Leviticus multiple times throughout the book. Mm -hmm. And that's probably because, you know, as a priest, he would have that memorized um, as a part of what his own actions would have been. Right. Yeah. Um, And so, you know, the call to come back to the law looks different in different ways in the different prophets. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, whereas we get a large focus on the covenant in a certain kind of way in Isaiah or in many of the other minor prophets, the way that Ezekiel does that is by specifically looking at Leviticus mm-hmm. over and over again. And uh, what is, yeah. And so that I think those are big parts of what you see. Do you, do you also see um, elements of, uh, or an emphasis on clean and unclean? Um, and that, because that's what strikes me is, is the things God asks him to do. Like you mentioned, cooking the food over and his, his, his revulsion 
at that. Yeah. And it's like, well, it's not just he's a germaphobe uh, or <laughs> he has standards of propriety, like everything about his life training in the priesthood. And then now God say, I mean, God, almost like when God told Peter, get up, kill and eat. And he was like, no, never. And that, that revulsion that Ezekiel feels is much more than just, oh, this is a gross thing. It's like, this is, it seems at least from that limited perspective as a compromise of everything that he knows God to be calling the priests to be. And that, that to me, that was a huge insight when I read, and it was, it was Christopher Wright's uh, message of Ezekiel commentary. I actually mm-hmm. just read that one time as a devotional reading. And it, it was the first time that I, it hit home to me. This guy was in exile. I mean, I'd kind of known that, but I never read the book with that, like as the dominant yeah. lens, like you said, in pain, in exile, in Babylon, uh, the best and the brightest having been taken away and him, one of them. Mm-hmm. And then he was training to be a priest and, and yeah. the year he was supposed to begin his priesthood, uh, you know, he has a vision of basically God saying, yeah, I'm out of here. Like this temple thing is, you know, I'm gone. And it's just such a, it, th- that, those kind of insights when you, when you read a book, I mean, you knowing, knowing your background in literature, knowing how important mm-hmm. literary uh, settings are and, and th- how a story is structured and how a thing, it's just, we, we, I don't want Dojo viewers to, to miss this, that knowing the things that, that Beth's talking about they really color how we read the text and it helps us appreciate even the gross parts or the weird parts. Yes. Yeah. Um, so did, did straight up, did Ezekiel see a UFO? Because that's <laughs> what you hear all the time, like aliens in the Bible, yeah. ancient aliens, and they'll point to Ezekiel. What uh, in the world is going on with wheels within wheels and creatures covered with eyes and, and just... So- I mean, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, but I'll start with saying this. I don't think that's UFOs. Um, what I'll say is that I think it's actually pretty similar to other scenes that we have where people come into the presence of God. Mm-hmm. It's just that Ezekiel does it with image on top of an image, on top of an image, on top of an image, on top of an image. Right. And so part of what we get in Ezekiel one, when this happens is I kind of think of it as um, coming into the presence of God undoes Ezekiel. Mm. So as he tries to describe what this undoing is, he has to try every single picture he can think of. And in doing so, he picks up on common images from his time period, um, things like the sort of chariot imagery mm-hmm. of, uh, of you know, the sort of storm god, the cloud god in the clouds, and like his wheels, but then his wheels can see the whole world, and so they have eyes on them, mm-hmm. and the circles and wheels and wheels. Um, you get this imagery also of he keeps saying it's like this, but no, it's like this. And yes, right. it's like this. And also like this. And you think about moments in your life where you have experienced something that goes beyond your ability to use words to describe it. And often you end up saying, well, it was kind of like this, right? Right. but it was also kind of like this. And it was also kind of like this. And I think that one thing that's interesting in Ezekiel is that all of that imagery actually actually connects to all of our senses. Hmm. So one of the things I do in class is we actually go through Ezekiel one and we look for every kind of sense. Hmm. So where is their hearing? Where is there something I might touch? Where is their taste? Where is their, you know, what I see? Um, how are each of those things drawing me into this moment that Ezekiel can't put words to, hmm. but he has to put all the words to. Right. Right. And so in some ways it's, it's, so many images and so many sounds um, that it, it it tries to recreate that ex, that almost that ecstatic experience mm. um, with all the ways that you could try to talk about it all on top of each other, and that's mm. why it gets complicated because mm. the images are all stacked um, one on top of another on top of another, and some of the images go back all the way to um, the Exodus story to Numbers to kind of so some of it's like. There's like the sort of fire and and cloud imagery. Right. Some of it goes to some of the like water imagery. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a combination. It's not it's not really trying to tell us, hey, he saw aliens. Right. More like, hey, he saw something that's really hard for him to put into words. Yeah. And so 
try to come with him, like join him right. to try and experience this. Yeah. It's very similar to, well, and it, it paves the way for how we approach Revelation in the New Testament. I mean, Revelation draws oh, sure. so heavily from Ezekiel. Um, mm. And and while Ezekiel, I don't think literary, we, it would be classified as apocalyptic, it it seems it, it ha- it's setting the stage, I think, for what would become apocalyptic in many ways, um, especially with its imagery. But there's, there's, yeah, when people read it as aliens, I'm always like, okay, time out. Like, read the whole chapter. It, it says yeah. pretty clearly this is a vision of the glory of God mm-hmm. and the glory of God leaving the temple, like going away. And that's that, that's the key, not the living creatures with eyes all over them and wheels within wheels. <laughs> and, well, you know, and it's interesting, your comment. Um, so in biblical studies, we sometimes separate these ideas of um, what is the prophecy and what is apocalypse. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, Ezekiel and Zechariah, they both sort of sit in this space of transition. Right. Um, right. And they give the groundwork. And that's why both, if for both of the books, the imagery is layers with layers with layers that ultimately gets picked up later um, right. to become the kind of apocalypses that were all around the time of Revelation itself. Mm-hmm. You know, and so it's interesting if you start with Revelation and then read Ezekiel, you can sometimes end up in a weird space trying to figure out what's happening in Ezekiel. Mm-hmm. But if you start with Ezekiel and try to understand it in its original context and then move to what is Revelation doing with this book? Yes. For an, another, you know, another generation in a different setting, but still facing oppression mm. and big imperial powers. And, you know, then how is that, how is that connecting and how is it giving comfort? Yeah. Um, which I think is also really important because both books function as both judgment and comfort, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think, I think I, one of the things I talk about a lot in my classes, I'm teaching a Jesus and the Old Testament class right now. Mm-hmm. And one of the things we talk about is the movement from the Old Testament to the New Testament um, as a really important movement because it helps us to better understand both. Yes. Um, And I think that's true with Ezekiel and with this sort of apocalyptic literature as well. Yeah. There are so many intertestamental echoes and, and it's a, it's a fascinating feel. I think if I had gone on for PhD, that would have been my focus is how, not just Hebrew Bible, but how is the Hebrew Bible found in the New Testament and what are the New Testament mm-hmm. authors doing? Mm-hmm. Because there's such a, the, 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 the trouble that I run up against as somebody who's a popularizer is I am, I spend my mental time in the world of academia, like reading journal articles and commentaries mm-hmm. and monographs and all of that stuff. But then I have to translate it to people who just have their Thompson Chain Reference Bible and maybe a Matthew Henry commentary, and they just are told, just read the text, plain meaning, just read the text, read it flat, scripture interprets scripture, follow your chains, and 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 you come up with this system. And it's very it's challenging to to try to say, okay, listen, that paradigm comes from a good intention of taking all of scripture seriously and of holding up scripture and and using scripture to interpret scripture because we do believe that it all is ultimately from the Lord and inspired by the spirit. But you've got to first understand these books on their own before you start jumping from one to the other. And, and I don't, I don't really know the answer to do that. Like, I don't, I don't know a shorthand way to do that. So with disciple dojo, that's part of why I love having people like yourself on to say, hey, let's do a little deep dive and and peek into the world of scholarship, and but with without um, without it becoming like this the old joke of it being a cemetery instead of seminary, oh, like sure. life giving scholarship, spirit led scholarship. Yeah. Um, there's just it's a hard it's it's like two worlds and you're trying to bridge them together so i appreciate yeah. that about your work uh, and, and your demeanor in helping people well, do that and i'll say i didn't say this at the start but besides my work with ambrose um i'm on our national team for my denomination and we do resourcing for our pastors mm-hmm. and so part of that work is that translation right mm-hmm. um trying to say like you know if academic work only is academics talking to academics i'm not sure it actually feeds 
what God wants to feed, which is right. everyone. Right. 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 Um, and so one of the gifts that my husband and I get to do, my husband and I did our PhDs together, him in theology and me in biblical studies. Mm -hmm. And so on the national team, we get to resource people to think about like, how do we think about the Bible? How do we think about theology and how do we make that accessible so that people feel like it's theirs and not just someone else's who has a PhD. Right. 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 Um, because I think that that part of what happens is that, um, if we're only given one model of how to think about how we read the Bible, we want to read faithfully. So we just follow that model. Mm -hmm. And fair enough, if that's the model we've been given and that's it, like, of course, we're going to read the Bible that way. Right. And so, you know, having other ways of thinking about it that helps us go deep and grow, um, that's my favorite thing. Um, it's yeah. why I like teaching pastors and training leaders, um, but also training congregants, like mm. just thinking together, like what is what is God trying to say um, mm. through his prophets? And then how does that connect to what we see in the New Testament and yeah. what Jesus does? And to me, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, I, I love showing people especially in Ezekiel. Um, well, one, it's just got some of the grossest passages. Like if you want to um, like sneakily, like in college, we used to, uh, you know, people leave a random Bible verse when they're signing a greeting card or something. And I'd be like, you know, get well soon, Ezekiel twenty three twenty, And it's just like, you know, the most, they turn to it and they're like, oh my gosh, what is this? And, and it's funny, but it's also, it's, it's what I like to do is to say, listen, even crazy verses and viewers, I'll let you look up Ezekiel 23, 20, even crazy, weird, gross sounding verses, God put that in scripture. And what do we do with it? It should make us, it should unsettle us. It should not go on a precious moments calendar verse of yeah. the day, but it is the inspired word of God. So it has to have something to say to us. And then that opens up the discussion of, okay, well, what's going on in this parable in Ezekiel 23 that God's telling that, and then that opens up the story of Israel as a whole and, and their obedience, their disobedience, the exile. It, it kind of like pulls people into this broader. And then by the time you're done, they're like, I didn't know any, like, this is a whole new world. And then it makes them want to go back and read the text, which is ultimately, that's the win. I yeah, think they were looking for sure. For. And I mean, the whole point is to draw you back into deep and full reading of the Bible and to yeah. keep going back to it. Yeah. Um, something I like to talk about with my students is this idea that the Bible is like this deep well mm -hmm. um, and you can swim at the top of it and there's real water there that you can swim in and you can keep swimming down and swimming down. There's fresh water all the way down. Yeah. And that sense that like, I just want to keep swimming and I'll just keep swimming and, um, and lean more and more into God's presence in that to know God more and mm -hmm. to understand my, like our relationship with him. Right. right, right. And, um, and I think that that's, um, the great gift of scripture. Um, yeah. but it also means that we get away from a simple, I know this, what this one verse means, um, out mm. of its context, because especially books like Ezekiel, and I'd say large portions of the Psalms too. Um, if we just take one verse by itself and yeah. we read it out of context, we, we miss what God's trying to do. And in yeah. fact, could read it like the opposite way of what yeah. it was intended to be. Um, yeah. I have a, a Christmas card <laughs> that has a, like a happy family picture. Uh -huh. And it's like, may God smash the teeth of my enemies or something like that. On it. <laughs> and I'm like, I just think it's hilarious because they look so happy. And, right, um, right. And, but I think that this notion of like, what do we do with the parts that are hard? Um, mm -hmm. Something I talk to my students because they're often like creating sermon series and things like that. And one of the things I say is, have you preached through all of Ezekiel? Mm -hmm. And the answer is almost always no. Right. Because some students are like, that's ludicrous. If you start <laughs> reading Ezekiel, you know why you don't mm -hmm. normally preach through all of Ezekiel. Yep. And we kind of talked about what are the things we're afraid of? Like, mm -hmm. what are the things that we're afraid to talk about or the things that we're afraid that maybe people won't understand? So we just don't talk about them. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think is that even some of those passages, in fact, some of the more difficult ones, I'd say Ezekiel 16 is a great example of a really, really, really hard passage uh, because mm -hmm. of the way women are described, or at least the nation is described like a woman. Right. Um, and the imagery is really pretty, pretty difficult. Yeah. Um, but one of the things I say is like that opens up conversations about a whole bunch of things of sexual violence and other questions that we don't talk about sometimes mm -hmm. we avoid. Mm -hmm. 
And because we avoid them, people who've actually been through those experiences don't get a chance to talk about their experiences or, or like heal. Right, right, right. And so I sometimes think, you know, it's good for us to, to face some of the hard parts of scripture. Right. Because it actually opens up the space for God to do the good work he wants to do in transforming us and, tra- and, and healing us in yeah. places where we've been hurt. Yeah, I agree. I think there's value to looking at the ugly parts of scripture. And it's not heretical to say that, that the Bible is filled Mm -hmm. with ugliness and evil. And an image that comes to mind for me is like back in this, I don't know, 60s, John Wayne era, there were a lot of World War II movies. And they were very um, sanitized and glib and running into battle. And and if people die, they would just uh, and fall down. And, and, but it was like, glorifying war, valorizing war. And then you come to a movie like Saving Private Ryan, where the first opening 20 minutes is just like people are throwing up in the theater because of how visceral and and people that were actually there had to leave at times because it gets so real. But there's a real value in that. I mean, that it, yeah. because it shows the ugliness of, in that case, yeah. World War II, the beach, um, Norman storming the beaches and all that. And it was just hellish and awful. Yeah. And I think as much as any other book, probably the most book, the book that does that the most, um, at least the large book that does that the most is Ezekiel. It, it holds your hands and walks you through the horror. Yeah. Um, and there's a benefit to that, to, to looking at it unflinchingly and not painting over it or, or make, okay, how do I apply this to my life? How do I apply this to my life? Like, will you apply, like, let it rock you to your soul. And that is applying to your life. That's shaping who you are at the soul level. Um, and, mm-hmm. and then keep reading the rest of the Bible because <laughs> it's not the only well, And I, I think some people, some of, some people have been through war mm-hmm. and they've seen the violence of war and others haven't, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so I teach students from all over the world, um, some of them who moved to Canada because they came out of spaces that were war-torn spaces. Mm-hmm. And when they read those passages in Ezekiel, they'll talk about the ways in which that actually feels like it meets them in mm. their own stories. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, uh, I was in a, a call, a podcast call a while ago, maybe a month or two ago, and we were talking about... Um, the imagery in Nahum, which I think there's some comparison to some of that imagery. And one of the things that we were talking about is I said, you know, I think when you haven't been, if you haven't been in war torn spaces, the violence of war feels like something unfamiliar. And therefore, when you see the impacts of war on women and children on Mm -hmm. the most vulnerable, and you see it in the biblical text, we don't know what to do with it. And sometimes we avoid it. Yeah. And so some of the imagery, a lot of the imagery of what we have uh, Ezekiel doing is actually mimicking the situation of what would happen in war. Mm -hmm. So he builds a wall, like a siege wall and destroys it. He um, eating the way he was eating that we must made the joke about eating over poop. But (laughs) like he's doing that because that's what they did in the city. By the way, that passage is not for a bread recipe. Um, Preach. Just so everyone knows. Preach. I was Not just going to ask you, let's, <laughs> let's talk about this because this is the kind of stuff that pops up on YouTube. So people have seen, oh, I'm going to do a fast or I'm going to eat healthy or I'm going to, what, what's the biblical recipe for eating? And there's Ezekiel bread in the store. Right. It's literally called Ezekiel bread. Yep. And what is the irony of ironies is that that is not what you're supposed to eat. That is famine siege rations and... Yeah. Just, just real quick, tell viewers. I don't. You're the guest. You're the Ezekiel expert. Just no, tell no, viewers no. why you should not be patterning your diet after Ezekiel bread. So Ezekiel, Ezekiel bread, or the bread that Ezekiel eats, um, is what it is because it is all they had during the siege. So it's the food you have when you have nothing. Yes. It's the little bits of things that you can piece together to try and make something to eat that has very little nutrition (laughs) and is intentionally has like it's it is uh, when you have actual starvation and you're trying to figure out what can I eat, you make this. So it's not meant to be healthy. (laughs) It's meant to it's meant to imitate what the was the, actually the worst food they were eating, yes. like basically in their history. Right. 
And um, and also, if you don't cook it over poop, you're not really eating Ezekiel bread. That's my other, you know, like we're going to be literal. We really need to right. actually do what it, it says. Um, <laughs> that I gets left out fake, of the marketing. <laughs> I actually have a fake Ezekiel loaf ad that it says now with real poop. <laughs> So, um, but I think, I think what's important is if this is another taking something out of context, right? Yes, yes, so you're like, yes. I, the, the goal is the initial purpose is great. Like I want to eat. What does the Bible tell me about eating? That's actually a wonderful right. aim towards faithfulness, right? <laughs> Especially if we think in the new Testament, like our bodies are a temple mm. and like we want to give ourselves all the solely to God. I think that's mm. a great instinct. The problem is picking up something out of context, not understanding why it is what it is, and then making that yes. into a diet. But also, I'll be real critical, making that into a diet so that someone else can earn money off yes. of you eating things that are actually not good for you. Yes, yes. That's the other part I have an issue with is that a lot of people who design these are actually trying to make money off of others. Yes. Which is also a problem. Yes. So you got two <laughs> problems, reading out of context and then also I think the misuse of that in general. Well, it's so. it's literally profiting off of biblical ignorance and, and and in depending on biblical ignorance for profit. And I don't even know if the creators had that nefarious purpose in mind, but it's it doesn't really make no. it it doesn't make it any less irresponsible. Um and and yet things like that are just there's so let, let me ask you about another one. And I don't know your we we haven't talked prior, so I don't know your views on genuinely asking. Sure. Um, you have people, especially now, past 150 years or so, but especially now, they are putting so much effort into helping ensure or aid or speed up the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, um, there's, there's, I mean, red heifers have been in the news that the cows they've brought in Texas and brought them in and getting ready to... Um, you know, the rabbis declare them and then they slaughter and the ashes and then that's going to be dedicated to the temple. Of course, there's the little small matter of there's a giant dome of the rock there. Um, and, and different Christians have different things on how that's going to be moved so that the temple can build. But a lot of it comes back to not, not all, but a lot of it to, well, the vision at the end of Ezekiel. He sees a rebuilt temple and this is the, the and, and therefore, in the millennium, there is going to be a rebuilt temple and there's going to be sacrifices because Ezekiel sees sacrifices in his vision. I have my own take on that, but I would love to hear how you help students navigate through that. And I don't know your eschatology. I don't know your, um, I, yeah. I'm not trying, you know, I'm not finagling you. I just want to know what do you, what do you do with sure. that? Uh, and how does that play a role in what we should be looking for in Middle East headlines? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously complex. Um, I'll start by saying that um, interesting relationship with some of the questions about what we do in relationship to Israel. So mm. I mentioned my dad's, my dad's Jewish, uh, yep. my family, my family, are like, we're, my, my dad is a Christian who's Jewish, the rest of my family are Jewish and not Christian um, mm -hmm. outside. And so um, we grew up capital Z or Z Zionist mm. um, to the point where my grandfather uh, was a gun runner in, for the Israeli army. Mm. Um, he used to roll, um, he used to roll firearms like um, in uh, carpets and send them oh, from wow. the U.S. Mm. to Israel. So, um, and I grew up around that, but then also made friends with Palestinians and it created mm. a really interesting like tension for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can imagine. How do I think about these questions and what do they mean? And so um where I've landed all of that, you know, is another subject. But just sure. to say that I think as we think about these questions, I also would differentiate between what does it mean to have a Christian response to that versus what Jews might have as a response to that. Mm. Because how Jews would read Ezekiel would not necessarily would would not be in light of the New Testament. Whereas mm. as Christians, I would imagine that we would read it in light of the New Testament. Right. Um, it doesn't mean that we start with the New Testament to read Ezekiel, but that where we go with Ezekiel now would be through the lens of the New Testament. Right. So. In Ezekiel's original vision, it's not completely clear if his vision is intended to be physical architecture mm -hmm. 
or if it's intended to be um, a future vision uh, that's more, you might say, like eschatological or more metaphorical. Um, and so starting with that question, is Ezekiel trying to actually give dimensions or is he doing something else um, is already a starting point for these questions, right? Right, right. Um, but I think, and I think that um, one of the things you see is that then you see Ezekiel picked up in the New Testament in particular ways. Mm -hmm. So in the New Testament, Ezekiel's picked up, but what the temple is has shifted. So in Jesus, we get the picture of Jesus's body as temple mm -hmm. in John's in John's gospel and in other places. Um, and then we also get that notion of the community of believers as temples and us individually as temples, which re doesn't completely remove the notion of a physical temple that existed. We see Paul going to synagogues and interacting. We see, uh, as far as we can tell, at least for a period of time, believers were, uh, before they were kicked out, believers were uh, part of these sacrificial ceremonies, as far as we know. Mm -hmm. But it does seem to relocate how the temple is understood within right. the Christian community. And so I would say that because we get a relocation of that in the New Testament, I would use that as a guiding principle for the actions I would take in relationship to Israel today mm -hmm. as a Christian. Now, you didn't ask that necessarily for a Jewish perspective, and I'm not Jewish in the sense, I can't separate my Christianity from my Judaism in this, right, right. but I will say that I understand with Jews come to a different perspective on that than if Christians do. Mm -hmm. But I think that we've been given a framework for what it looks like, how temple is understood in the New Testament that right. then would affect how we answer those questions for today. Well, let me ask you this, because one thing that... Um, uh, and I and I know Judaism is a spectrum, just like Christianity. There, there's, and that's one of the things I've enjoyed when I have Jewish guests on, and mm -hmm. we've talked about these things, and, and and said, yeah, there there are some Jews that believe this, and some that believe this, just like there's some Christians that believe this and this. So that's that's the thing that I, I want viewers to know up front very clearly. Um, but typically, I believe. The let me say traditionally Jewish readings of Ezekiel, the vision of the dry bones and and being resurrected is 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 less a, a snapshot of what's going to literally happen to individual people, and more a Nash, a symbol of the nation being brought back mm -hmm. together. And, and then of course, it, at the end end resurrection, maybe, you know, there's some rabbinic discussion about how yep. the resurrection is going to happen. But primarily what Ezekiel seeing under traditional Jewish interpretation is the res restoration of the people. So then it seems that then the next, the chapters right after that, where he's measuring this temple and it's clearly a supernatural temple. I mean, it's turning the Dead Sea into fresh water and doing all this stuff that geographically doesn't work in the Holy land right now, but they, that also is seen as again, not here are the, the dimensions for this thing we need to start building. Um, even though there is a desire to rebuild the temple and all that, but it's not coming from Ezekiel, at least from what I understand. And yeah, is that fair? Is that accurate? In, in I mean, I think it's, again, it's this question of when you look at the spectrum of Judaism around such readings, right. um, you really do get the, quite a strong diversity. Mm -hmm. So, um, so certainly there are Jews who would read um, Ezekiel's imagery in the temple imagery, as well as the imagery in the dry bones um, passages as a metaphor for the coming together of Israel, its restoration in a sense of community, mm. um, its restoration. Some would say then, you know, to Torah, like to the law and to, to come back as a community. Um, it's notable um, that you get a framing around the, the tribes and the structure of the tribes in connection to the structure of the temple. Um, and so there's certainly readings that are like that, mm. but you know, there's also um, it, 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 Judaism so big Mm. That it's, uh, I remember, I'll just give a comparative. I used to teach at a Catholic university and people would say, so what do Protestants think about this? Right, right, right. <laughs> and then they'd say, well, what do charismatics think about this? Yeah. And yeah. I would always laugh and I'm like, um, 
Well, that's a big question because <laughs> sure. there's not really an answer to that question. There's yeah. a whole lot. And I'd say the same thing about these, the reading of Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you, you certainly, you get a range in the same way, in part because you get a range of what other sources they're using and also how they think about the text in general. Mm -hmm. Is the text primarily and often um, a metaphor for the community? Or is the is is there a sense of um, of the rites and rituals that are at the heart of what the text is, and depending upon where on the spectrum of Judaism you are affects how you read that. Right. And so, um, so again, I can't speak as a Jewish scholar in that way. Um, I'm ethnically Jewish, but I would not describe myself as a Jewish scholar in that way. I describe right. myself as a Christian scholar. Yep. But from reading about it from Jewish perspectives, that would be kind of the range you mm -hmm. get. Well, it's a it's a good discussion. And the only reason I bring it up is because I want viewers to to know the lay of the land when it comes to mm -hmm. these passages that they may have only heard read one way their whole life. Yeah. And to stop and go, actually, there's a there's a strong tradition of reading it this way. And there's a strong tradition of reading it this way. And and only when we understand the different ways people have approached the text, then we can make an intelligent decision on what we think makes the most sense as we're reading yes. the text. But if we don't know that that's even an option, then it really handicaps us in our ability to, to, to weigh and, and, and to wield scripture. I think, um, that's, that's those, that's why I value these discussions and, and why I like in our study Bible reviews here on the channel, I'll always say the best study Bibles are the ones that when they come to a passage that has multiple readings, they give you the readings and the strongest argument for each. And even if they end up going one way, you know, which is up to the editor, they still at least alerted you as a reader. That they're the, yeah. So I'm, I'm glad that you're making that point about Judaism and, and, and it applies to Christian interpretation as well. Yeah. Um, Ezekiel is a weird book. And there's different ways Christians have read it. Let me ask you one more Zico question. And then I want to switch sure. gears. Um, you, in your article, uh, you had a quote. You said the, the article was about hope in Ezekiel. And you did this cool thing. I won't give it away here on the channel. I want readers to go. So I'm going to link it in the show notes. But you, you, you compare Ezekiel to Dr. Seuss. And there's a great illustration of what a chiasm is using Dr. Seuss. So that's very <laughs> much in the ballpark of what we do here with Superhero Seminary, like using pop culture to teach biblical concepts. So viewers, go after this interview, click the link and read Beth's article because it's a great, great illustration of a biblical concept, chiasm. But the quote you said, and I want you to just unpack this a little bit. You said uh, it's about hope in Ezekiel. And you said, hope comes not only because God promises to restore and heal, but also because God promises to bring justice in situations of injustice within the community itself. To restore order to his people, God needs to root out not only the outside forces that have hurt them, and that would be the Babylonians in Ezekiel's day, but also the ones within who have hurt them as well. What kind of uh, just tease that out a little bit for us of, of the book of Ezekiel and why that's an important thing to recognize. Yeah. And I mean, we could talk about it broadly, but I'll start with just talking about Ezekiel 34, which is the, the section I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in Ezekiel 34, you get two different parts of critique that's happening. Um, and on the one hand, you have this critique of the leaders of Israel at the time who have allowed the people to, um, to go astray, to be hurt. Um, and, and the way they've been hurt is by being attacked by kind of the sort of like exterior wild animals kind of image, right? They've, they've been sent off into spaces that are unsafe for them. Mm -hmm. And that's the picture really of like the impact of Babylon and, um, and the violence that had happened in Babylon to the people and God saying, I won't let you shepherd the people anymore. I will be their shepherd because you've allowed them to be hurt. Right. But you also see that it's not just leaders who are called to account, that actually there's also a, among the sheep themselves, there's sheep who are hurting other sheep. Mm -hmm. And so you have sheep, the fat sheep, um, they're, they're, they're the ones that um, 
they're aware of the vulnerability of the weak and and thin sheep. Um, and what they do instead of caring for the sheep among them who are struggling, they um, they it's described as them like basically walking in with muddy feet into their water to make their water unclean mm. and eating all of their food so that they cannot actually, those weaker sheep, the vulnerable sheep, um, they, they remain thin and effectively starving, mm. um, because of it, um, thirsty and starving, which mm -hmm. we know long-term leads to their death. Right. And so this internal situation it's not just about what the leaders do or don't do, but how we treat each other mm -hmm. and how in the time, um, how the people were mistreating each other and using the situation, um, a difficult situation to, to their advantage for those who already had power and already had wealth, yeah. um, to, to take advantage even more of those who were vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I think is important is to understand that when God critiques, he doesn't just critique the outside bad imperial forces out there. He doesn't just say leaders, you should have, you should have been paying attention and caring for those who you are taking care of, but everybody are you caring for each other mm -hmm. or are you part of the process of oppressing each other? Yeah. And, um, you know, I sometimes talk about what this looks like for us today. I mean, I think about this on a global scale and then on a smaller scale. So on a global scale, the richest parts of the world have made, created situations in other parts of the world where they were already poorer to make it even worse for them. Yeah. So we pollute our, we, um, pollute areas, other areas of the world. Um, we actually do almost what's described. We make their water dirty for our benefit. Right. We take their food for our benefit. Um, so that we have issues in, um, North America, um, where, we have an overabundance and we have even an issue of like food waste because we have so much food, we waste it. Mm -hmm. And in order to produce that food, we've taken advantage of others mm -hmm. in other parts of the world. Right. But we also see that even just in a, like in a, in a smaller church setting. Right. So are we aware of when we use our power and we hold that over someone else? Are we aware of when we're caring for those who may be struggling? Mm -hmm. Do we use that to our advantage or do we help? And these are real questions yeah. that I think Ezekiel raises, not just to pastors, but to every, like anybody yeah. who's in the community. And so God wants to heal and to restore everyone. Like mm. God wants that for everybody. But he also wants to fix situations that are broken. Mm -hmm. um, and when they're, when they're not set the way they're supposed to, he wants to, reset them. Yeah. And so justice in its most basic sense is this larger notion of shalom, right? It's um, bringing things back into the right way when they're in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And so in this idea that God will do that, he'll, tr he will do that work of trying to set things right. And if you're on the side where setting things right um, means that you get cared for when you didn't before, if you're among the vulnerable or the oppressed, that's good news, but it can feel like hard news if you're among the ones who've been doing this mm -hmm. um, to hurt others. And so um, so I think that's a bit of what we see. And I think it's a picture of hope overall, though, because mm -hmm. it doesn't just hurt those who are vulnerable when we when someone with power hurts them. It actually hurts the person who does it. Mm -hmm. It does. It hurts everyone. Right. Right. And so to bring true healing and restoration, God has to set everything right. Yeah. Um, and so I am encouraged by Ezekiel's picture because while it can cause me to ask really deep questions about what am I, what am I aware of and caring for and what am I doing in my life uh, or in the church or what does it look like? Does my community look like that or not? Um, mm. It also opens up a door for, more connection and care for each other. Yeah. Which I think is really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I, one of the, th I, there are two things that jump out to me about this discussion that, and, and about reading Ezekiel that's, that is beneficial um, and, and inspires hope. And one is that, you know, you, you talk about God's judgment when God puts things right. 
um, for the for the oppressed, it's the greatest news in the world. And for the oppressor, it's the worst news in the world. That's every court case, you know, every court case where somebody has a complaint against another, when the judge bangs the gavel, it means good news for one and bad news for the other. And the only drawback is that human judges are are not omniscient and make mistakes or don't fully render justice or can't bring back what's been lost and, or can't restore what's been lost. Whereas the divine judge at the end of history, not only can, but says that he will, and even death itself will be overdone and the, and the importance of the resurrection so that nothing that gets overlooked, like no tear is wasted in eternity. Yeah. If there is a judge who is keeping faithful track record of, of all the wrongs, and mm. the second thought that it brings up this whole, your article and thinking about this concept in Ezekiel is it, there's, there's something that's always made me like, I find myself in this weird place where I have, I, I have a really strong, uh, visceral desire for what some people would call social justice um, in, in certain contexts. There are certain things that I'm like, no, this is not liberal or, or conservative. This is just justice, biblical justice. Yeah. And people dismiss it. Oh, that's that's social justice, whatever, you know. And and there's the truth that. But at the same time, when I look at some Christians who are the most vocal in favor of social justice, they are often doing it from a theology or a hermeneutic kind of a liberation theology that that makes me uncomfortable because it seems to ignore what you bring out in Ezekiel, which is that sin is not just a matter of those on the outside oppressing those on the inside, yeah. but it's those on the outside and those on the inside, the oppressed turning on and oppressing one another. So you think of country like like where rich countries do go and exploit like like the Democratic Republic of Congo, for instance, uh, just go in and completely rape the land of all of its resources, creating a situation of utter uh, corruption, whereby then the poorest of the poor people ha turn on each other to try to get ahead to. And so you can't just look at that and go, oh, well, the solution is kick out the imperial aggressors and everything will be great. Because sin's so much more insidious than that, and it's wormed its way down into even the most oppressed people oppress each other. And, and so that's where I, I appreciated your article highlighting that aspect of God's judgment is that it it's a holistic judgment. It doesn't settle for the 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 callous conservatism or the yeah. social justice uh, a class warfare approach, yeah. but it's like, God's taking into account all of that. And, and it gives it gives me hope that we don't have to look to earthly schemes of how to bring about the the ultimate. I mean, we yes, we work to bring about justice, you know, on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we are called to do. But we don't have to rely on that as the end of the matter, that there's there's one above all. Uh, yeah. who's putting things right. So that to me, that was where your article resonated. Um, yeah. And I hope viewers, I'm again, viewers, I'm going to link the article, go mm -hmm. read it over at Hebraic Thought, which is a, a, a friend of, of Disciple Dojo's as a, as a website. You should have that bookmarked and read the stuff that goes on over there because it's really excellent stuff. One of the minor prophets you mentioned was Nahum. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you talked about that being a book that's kind of difficult or, or has some striking imagery. The irony is, of course, Nahum is the word for comfort. Um, yeah. to be comforted or to comfort. And so it's very much, very much ironic. Uh, I think that, isn't that the same, doesn't Jonah mean dove? Is Jonah mean dove or is that, or, or like, I it, I, yeah, I, there's the one in the minor prophets as an, it's either Joel or Jonah that it, it's a very sweet word, but then yeah. like the book is like, you're going to burn yeah, yeah. 40 days and then it was destroyed. To clarify, <laughs> I actually think Nahum is a book of comfort. So mm -hmm. we can have a whole conversation about that if you'd like, because I actually don't think it's ironic. I actually think Nahum actually thinks his message is a message of comfort. So we could, you know, talk more about that if you want to. Um, but I do think that it's, you know, this is, the, I think that that's an interesting matter of perspective. Right. Well, um, mo would you agree though that most pew sitters when you think of hey let's turn to a passage about comfort most of them are not <laughs> yeah. going to go to Nahum 
Like that's not going to be their first stop. Yeah, no, no, definitely not. Um, But they're missing out is what you're saying. (laughs) Well, what I'm trying to say is that um, you made the comment about in a trial, Mm -hmm. the person, the judgment on, on the person who committed the crime is going to, the judgment will feel negative. But for those who are oppressed or have been experienced the violence of the crime, yes, that is comfort. Yes. And so one of the things I say is I think Nahum is a book that if you view it from the perspective of those sitting on the side of those imagining it like I am someone whose child has been murdered. Mm-hmm. And what I want to hear is that the city of blood, the space of violence will be judged appropriately by the judge of all creation. Yes. And that in, in, and that will be comfort Mm -hmm. because right now I'm not comforted because there's, hasn't been that. And so I think, I mean, that's, I think that's one of the kind of pieces in there that Mm -hmm. I think in general, I think the minor prophets explore this in lots of different ways. Mm -hmm. Um, Where is comfort found? What is suffering? Where is God in that? Um, I think this is connected to kind of where we talked about maybe going a little bit in terms of talking about the Odyssey and even the questions of, is God good in his judgment? Can a good God allow for suffering? Mm -hmm. Um, These are all kind of connected questions, I think. Yeah, that that does segue into what I wanted to focus on because – you you've written an introduction. What's the na- the title of the book? You did the introduction. You co-authored the introduction. Yes. For. So the book is the Odyssey and Hope in the Book of the Twelve. The Book of the Twelve just being another term for the Minor Prophets. Right. Right. The Odyssey and Hope in the Book of the Twelve. Um, and I'll link to that as well. I, I read that introduction. You wrote it with tr- who was the trim- trimmer? Who was her co-author? Uh, Daniel Daniel Timmer. 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 I was thinking of Charlie Trim. My friend. No. Timmer. Daniel Timmer. <laughs> Um, you co-authored it with him, and and it w- it's the introduction to the book, which then is a number of essays that unpack this concept within the Minor Prophets. So let's just real quick for viewers who, because we have dojo viewers of every level of biblical yeah, yeah. scholarship, what does theodicy mean first, and then walk us through how the Minor Prophets have anything to do. When I think of theodicy, I mean, most people think of the Odyssey in the Bible that know what the Odyssey means, which you're going to tell us in just a second. They usually go to the wisdom books. They go to Job. Yeah. They go to Ecclesiastes. Um, they don't typically go to the maybe maybe they'll go to Habakkuk if they're a little more uh, yeah. biblically literate. But but typically it's not where they first go. So give us real quick. What is the Odyssey? And then what do the minor prophets have to contribute to our thinking about the Odyssey? So, I mean, kind of in a general sense, the Odyssey, I find it helpful to actually just take the term itself and start with that. So the Theo part of it is God, the DC, the, that part it comes mm-hmm. from DK, which means justice. Mm-hmm. And so it's the idea of how do we, uh, if we have a God um, who is all powerful and good, how do we have suffering and evil? Mm -hmm. So where is the God of justice is kind of another way uh, to quote Malachi. Like Mm -hmm. where is the God of justice in the world we see in front of us? Mm -hmm. Um, And so it it tends to run into a couple different directions. So is God therefore not all powerful or is God therefore not actually good in the way we would describe good or is our understanding of evil or suffering simply misunderstood and so there's because those are the three kind of pieces to theodicy, you're often kind of balancing those pieces. And it was very important to me that the book wasn't only about theodicy, mm-hmm. but actually about how theodicy and hope relate to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, because I actually think that uh, the Bible has a lot more to say about the nature of where God produces hope in the midst of suffering and evil. Right. Um and that's actually the emphasis of most of what the Bible has to say about it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, in the traditional sense, the Odyssey is a term that is a later term before the Bible, like after the Bible existed. So um, it's a philosophical term. But the notion that we might ask God, why? Um, or like, God, where are you mm-hmm. in the midst of suffering? That is biblical. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so the the notion that we might create some kind of philosophical like explanation, that's a later, 
thing, but asking God, what are you doing with this situation? Why is this happening? What are you going to do? Mm. Um, that's very biblical. Um, mm. And where is hope in the midst of that is also very biblical. Mm. So how then do, how do the prophets in particular, because yeah, the psalmists are always asking, you know, God, where are you? Why are you hiding yes. your face? What are you doing? Uh, you've put me here, you know, like the Psalms just kind of lay it out there. What about, because the minor prophets are some of the least read part of the Bible for most mm-hmm. Christians. What, what are some things, some insights, some, some rays of hope that you see in the face of suffering as you f- go through the minor prophet? I mean, we don't have to do exhaustive, but just some that, yeah. that really jump out to you that readers should take a second look at maybe, or a first look if they've never read those passages. I mean, um, you know, uh, you mentioned Habakkuk. I think Habakkuk is one of the is a good, helpful starting place because I think it's the first place we often go to out of the minor prophets. Mm-hmm. Because Habakkuk begins in its first two chapters, really almost crying out to God, but like even angry with God. Yeah. Um, why? Because it seems to be a book that's set in the kind of exile period, and it's very similar actually to some of our psalms that we get from that time period. You know, why God are you allowing this to happen? Why have you allowed? Are you paying attention? Um, are you here? Do you care? Mm. Um, real questions about how God is responding to situations, um, to the pain and the loss that they are experiencing um, and asking whether God will come and interact with the people or not. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, to say the other hope side of that Habakkuk ends with this song uh, that feels a lot actually like some of the Thanksgiving Psalms and things like that, that we get in, uh, in the Psalms. Um, and there's a sense of like, returning to God or responding to God in, in him meeting us. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very interesting because we also don't actually fully see God show up, but we get the movement of what you sometimes we refer to as the U shape of a lament. So we mm-hmm. get the beginning that calls out to God and cries out to God. And then we get this sort of hopeful movement towards pr- trust um, at the end of Habakkuk. And so um, Habakkuk is a great example, I think, of exploring these questions in a way that um, that allows for people to speak to God honestly mm-hmm. and then find a way to come towards God t- with hope, I think. Um, that, that would be one of the spaces. But I think you also see some interesting movements in books like Joel. Mm-hmm. So Joel has this very, uh, it's, it's coming after some very, uh, painful situations for the people Mm -hmm. and it's described as like a locust plague. Um, and, and, and there's probably a combination of like an actual locust plague and then also war feeling like a plague of locusts. Mm -hmm. So, um, in the, in the ancient world and even today, actually, uh, locusts are like, you can get a swarm of locusts and they will just destroy everything. They'll just come in and like, it's scary. Um, and, um, and so, so the, the comparison of uh, this sense of like locusts coming in and destroying everything and taking the food and causing the possibility of starvation and comparing that to like invading armies who come in and just take over everything and make it really hard to live and people die. And um, and that that cry that happens in in Joel is answered with, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. Mm. And it's this repeated refrain that God God has a plan for the people that he will return to them what they've lost. Um, but also in the midst of it, before that, that response of I will repay you, there is a moment where he asks them to wail. Mm-hmm. And to, he, he calls them to this moment of repentance, transformation, return. Um, and so there's a sense in which they weep. They're called to weep and wail before God. They come and cry out to him. And God responds by saying, what you lost, I will repay. Mm. I will t- I will give it back to you. And I think that um, this is an interesting when you think about struggles and suffering and like, what do we experience? How much of it is something we have been part of creating? How much of it isn't? Mm. One of the things about the prophets more broadly is that um, unlike wisdom literature, where you get a mix of imagery, sometimes there's there's um, some responsibility, and sometimes it's really just righteous suffering. There isn't responsibility associated with it. Right. Um, in the prophets, it's often sort of somewhat a little bit the fault of the people or a lot the fault of the people. Mm-hmm. 
But what I think is interesting about that is that that's not the only picture, first of all. It's not every single time something happens, it's always our fault. Mm -hmm. I think that's important to realize. But alongside it, if it is our fault, God is faithful to repay Mm -hmm. and to restore. And so I think that can be a really helpful, helpful message, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so those are just some examples. Um, The, the, The minor prophets are a challenge for a lot of readers because one, they're not chronological. Uh, two, they don't, you got to know the backstory of a lot of things to catch their message. I remember in college, I would just sit down and be like, I'm going to read Zephaniah. And I would read it and be like, this is really intense imagery, but I don't have any idea what it's talking about. And, and, it, and it's okay. I mean, you can still get something from that, but when you when you know when you start to learn the story of Israel and and the 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 world in which it it's kind of like if you it's not it's not a one to one comparison but I always try to think of ways to reframe things for viewers and um, mm. if I if I show somebody a bunch of memes on social media right now. 15 years from now, there's a good chance they won't know what those memes are referencing. I mean, unless they're like yeah. the heavy hitters, you know, the, the super shared memes. Um, even now, there's stuff that like if you go watch old episodes of The Office or something, uh, they'll mm-hmm. reference pop culture. Right. And you're like, oh, yeah, that was a thing. I forgot about that. You know, like, but but if you know what's going on at the time, if you know the cultural background, then those memes make sense. Those illusions make sense. You kind of, you can track with the intention of the writer of the show or the creator of the meme. And I think with the Minor Prophets, it's, I mean, it's not one-to-one, but it is in the sense that if you don't know about the brutality of Assyria, um, you right. will miss some of what uh, Nahum, Nahum's writing against Assyria, right? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to keep him straight in my head. You'll you'll miss some of you, or you you won't you just won't appreciate the depth of of what he's talking about and the irony of him describing what's going to happen to this people who did these kind of things to so many others and um, yeah. and then the then the the crazy twist that Jonah throws in where you have the uh, Ninevites being the closest thing to a good guy uh, in the story and Jonah being the bad guy, um, yeah. which is just so bizarre, but it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful. Jonah is my favorite of yeah. the minor prophets for, for many reasons, but, but all that to say, uh, and for viewers having insight into what's going on in the world of the text brings the text to life. And it, and it helps mm. keep you from doing the thing that we talked about earlier with Ezekiel bread or, or even I see it, you, uh, you see it in, in Habakkuk where people will pull out the, uh, be amazed. I'm going to do something that's never been done. Blah, blah, blah. And it's like this, it'll get thrown around in charismatic circles as this, God's got a new thing for you. But in Habakkuk, it's like destruction and death yeah. is coming. <laughs> it's not mm-hmm. a good thing at all. Yeah, um, I've got a vision for you. It's coming. Wait you, for it. Wait no, for like, it. The next thing, like the thing that's coming isn't like, is it going to be like a happy reformation or a renewal? Yeah. Like there's some hard stuff coming. Yeah, it's not so, your prosperity yeah. year that God's talking about. Yeah, absolutely. But I think that well, comes think- from people not knowing. I mean, people just coming to the text, not having the background and reading the words and, and not from a bad motive or, or anything, just from yeah. lack of knowledge if you don't know how to use a tool, you'll misuse the tool and you may get something right. You know, you may can hammer something with a wrench, but it's not what the wrench was made for. Um, And so I appreciate, you know, the work of people like you that help people do that, that help them use the wrench as a wrench, not a hammer. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, you know, there's, there's different resources we can use to get started with that. I mean, I love that you do reviews on study Bibles because one of the things study Bibles often do is even that first page before you read the section, Mm -hmm. just to get a sense of like what's happening leading up to this particular book and like, what's the context for it? Because I I often say to students, it's weird that we read the Bible the way that we do. There's Mm. no other book that you would just pick up and pick a sentence out of it and assume you knew what it meant. Exactly. Right? Right. We would never do that. We wouldn't pick up a novel. Right, right. We wouldn't just like 
to pick a line from a movie and assume we'd understand the movie. Right. Because we read, heard one sentence. From it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And, and so that we treat the Bible that way is very interesting because it means that we don't, we don't treat it even with the respect we treat other things that matter less to us. Right. And so I kind of think that, you know, you can, there's ways that you can do that. I think um, we have, thankfully, we ha are live in a world where there's some really good down to earth commentaries mm -hmm. and also really helpful, um, like the study Bible pieces, I think that can be really helpful. And I yeah. think, you know, just that starting point that you want to know the background so that you can read this book you haven't read before. Yeah. And yeah. I think anytime you're reading, I remember the first time I read through the Minor Prophets and I was like, oh goodness, what is this? And <laughs> Particularly the book I just argued is comforting. I remember reading it and going, I don't want to talk about that. That's awful. <laughs> um, and now I read it and I read it with with people who have had um, really terrible, terrible violence done against them. Mm -hmm. And and how they would see, what would they see when they look at this book? Right. Um, you know, and I think that even just being able to, ch to be able to shift our our view because we shift where we sit in history. We can like think about what it's like mm -hmm. and even just think about what does that look like for us? I mean, would we have a different perspective on something if we were in the middle of the pain of it versus in, you know, the hope or the, the right. provision, um, you know? Um, and I think, I think that one of the amazing things about the Bible is that it gives all of those emotions, mm -hmm. the whole broad sweep of them. Mm -hmm. And the minor prophets, especially, um, you know, I think, uh, you get, you get a broad variety, but with the minor prophets, yeah, it's 12 books, many of them really short and short and sometimes like very directed in particular ways. And you kind of have to know why they're directed in that way. Like, right. so why is Obadiah so mad about Edom? Mm -hmm. Like, why does he keep talking about the Edomites? Who right. are the Edomites? Right. Um, and so knowing, the Edomites, what they did in relationship to Israel, that they betrayed Israel, that they were like a brother to Israel, and they chose to betray Israel in a way that allowed for intense, awful things to happen to Israel, gives you a different view on Obadiah than without it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, if you read it as a story of like that time that someone you loved betrayed you and you thought you could trust them and they didn't, mm -hmm. you couldn't then you read it differently than if you don't have that context. Yeah. Um, and the betrayal was not a, just a betrayal of honor, but it was a betrayal that resulted in murder and pillaging and rape and destruction and ecological disaster. And I, exactly. you know, we, we, we particularize so much of the Bible and we try to apply it to our lives. And, and for, yeah. for viewers that are modern uh, 21st century North American, that is a life of relative comfort, um, at least in terms of physical violence and, and having your being victimized by people. So we tend to read thing. We, we tend to spiritualize those things. And if it's talking about an attack, we just think, Oh, an attack on my character. But we got to always remember that's not originally, it was originally about a literal attack and, and so, yeah, literal victims. I mean, exactly. And if you think, you know, if, if the betrayal that someone did to you caused your child to die, Yes. You read it very differently yes, than yes, if yes. it, you know, made you feel bad for a minute, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I think about, I kind of think about ways we can understand that framework and understand it as a group. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, not just me, but my brother and my sister and my dad and my, you know, my grandfather who isn't with us now because this person, this, this group of people betrayed us. Right. Right. Um, that affects how we can read. And so I think um, the more we can get into those spaces, the better we can understand how that was a word to from God to people in the middle of their experiences right, and right. how then we can take the part of that that connects to us today um, in a meaningful way. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's so much we could talk about. Um, and there's just, uh, I want you, you have a standing open invitation to come back to Disciple Dojo Thanks because I you. thoroughly love this conversation and it's great to just sit and chat uh, and and just to kind of meander and see where things go, I so we'll we'll there's some other stuff that that um, I'd mentioned talking about, but but we'll save it for another time. Um, I know you've sure. got to get going soon, and, and I do as well. But it, I I want viewers to know a couple of things. One is um, I'm going to put the link 
like I've said, to the article on Hebraic Thought. Go check that out for Ezekiel stuff. Do you is there a is there a a, a lay level a popular level commentary that you would recommend? I mean, I've recommend Christopher Wright's message of Ezekiel. Uh, do you have one in addition to that, or or that you would say, hey, if you're an interested Bible reader, this will help you navigate this book? Is there anyone that jumps out? I mean, you don't have to, but. The book that I'd recommend <laughs> yeah. is um, by Michael Lyons, An mm. Introduction to the Study of Ezekiel. Okay. Um, and it's part of um, it's part of the TNT Clark approaches to in to biblical studies okay. series. So wonderful. Well, I, we love putting pointing people to resources. Let me ask you one more. Put you on the hot seat because you mentioned sure. uh, a good study Bible. Um, are there are there any that you have found to be particularly helpful in helping students? get into the world of the text just off the top of your head. Um, I mean, there's some excellent ones. It depends on if they're looking more for ones that are about like the background. Um, I find some of the background ones very helpful. So there's a few of those. IVP has some really great uh, ones for some of that. Um, and then there's also ones that are, um, Zondervan has some that um, that are background focused. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are others that are more, I'd say like content focused. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there's some great NIV study Bibles, for example, I think are really great. I'm mm -hmm. part of a study Bible that will be coming out not too long from now, uh, the Upside Down Kingdom study Bible. So I got to, you know, also suggest that's going to be, I think, a really helpful one. I'm Something looking I'm forward. Is, I'm looking forward to yeah. getting a copy and reviewing that one because I, I know a couple of people that are involved in it. And that's exciting. So I will definitely be I plugging think it'll, that. I think it'll be great because I think it'll uh, help people think a lot about kind of the where is the kingdom of God and how that, is that moving through scripture. So I think that's going to also be a really helpful one. Or I mean, mm. I'm part of it. So I hope that 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 is helpful. That's so. the goal. Which part? What did you uh, per contribute in particular, if you don't want me asking? Yeah. So I did uh, family and kinship and I also did leadership. Okay. And so I looked at um, so I did two different trajectories, um, one that was more like what are the family relationships we see and how do they work? Mm. Um, and then others that are more like, what is leadership? How do we know what it is? How does God yeah. define that in relationship to the kingdom? Yeah. Well, then let me ask you also, is the, are there any, do you know of any good commentaries on the minor prophets that it may be coming out in the near future? I mean, is it wrong to just say, hey, I have a minor <laughs> prophet commentary? I feel like I should say someone else's. <laughs> I No, I served it up on a plate for you. Tell us, uh, no. no, tell us about, you You do have a commentary coming out on the Minor Prophets. Um, tell us real quick about that series and sure. what they can expect in it. Yeah, so the Story of God uh, Bible Commentary series is a, a series that has a strong emphasis not only on getting some of that background information, but in a really accessible way, mm -hmm. but also... Um, what does it mean to live the story today? So, mm -hmm. um, so the Bible is the the commentary is very focused on this idea of how does it continue to how does the Old Testament in these ways continue to live, um, and some of that's talking about how that relates to the New Testament, but some of it's also thinking about what that means for today as we look at the world around mm -hmm. us. Um, and so, my commentary, my two volumes um, are two volumes on the Minor Prophets. Um, so, volume one is. Um, Hosea to Micah and then uh, Nahum to Malachi. Um, so get all 12 um, in two different volumes and they're connected volumes, basically. Yeah, that's great. I love that series. Viewers, if you remember, uh, we've had a number of contributors to that series here. Um, Nijay Gupta did Galatians. Um, uh, Jay Sklar did Numbers. Paul Evans did Samuel. Um, and then there's some others. It, it's a really good series. So that's awesome. One that you're that you did the minor prophets and two it's two volumes because sometimes minor prophets just get kind of crammed into one volume and uh, that just means less depth for each one. So it, it's cool yeah. that they expanded it too. When it comes out, um, definitely let me know. Talk to sure. uh, tell tell the marketing team that we want you back on the dojo to talk about it and and awesome. get word out because that's that's one of my favorite things to do through this ministry is put good resources in front of people and and that they have access to. Um, so lastly, then and this is the most immediate one, people can study with you if they want to. Yeah. Um, they can actually online learn from Dr. Beth Stovell. How do they do that? 
Yeah. I mean, so we've got, I've got a couple different ways they can do that. Um, Ambrose offers hybrid courses. So if you're ever wanting to take a course and you want to do an online version of that, that's through like our Ambrose website, you can get access that way. But we also have a Seminary Now course coming. Um, and uh, the Seminary Now course is a four credit Old Testament survey course um, that you can come and take with me. And that's um, an online course. Um, and uh, that'll be happening this starting the spring, and then they'll be continuing to offer it. And then um, I'm also doing something that's more like a course, that, a mini course mm -hmm. um, that you can see just on the Minor Prophets. And so tw 12 sessions on the Minor Prophets appropriately mm -hmm. uh, with me and uh, my colleague, Dr. Colin Toppelmeyer. He's also a Minor Prophets person like I am. Um, also, interestingly, someone I've been friends with for a really, really long time. And so there's a lot of rapport there. That's cool. Uh, so, yeah. So if people want to study with that, you can check it out on seminarynow.com. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, and learn more about what's being offered. Yeah, Seminary Now is a cool resource, and I and I've talked to the folks over there, um, uh, and and I've you know I've told them like Disciple Dojo wants to help point people in that direction because there are mm -hmm. so many. I mean, you, Richard Middleton, Carmen Irons, like they're they're just they're good, solid, very much dojo approved <laughs> teachers uh, have courses on there. So viewers, I'll mm -hmm. put a link to Seminary Now. Um, check that out as well. If you've enjoyed any or all of this conversation, that'll be right up your alley. Well, Beth, thank you. Thank you so much. I, we're coming out right at an hour and a half and, and um, it's just, it was a treat. This is one of uh my favorite things about this channel is getting to sit down and Bible nerd out with bona fide yeah. scholars. Uh, so it's just, thank you so much. It's a joy having you here in the dojo. Well, thanks, Jam, for inviting me. It's, I really enjoyed this. This has been great. So awesome. I look forward to coming back again sometime. We'll have you back. You you are, you are will be a dojo blue belt next time you come back. This is your white belt Ooh. appearance. You've, you've passed this test. So... We, uh, yeah, we, we try to keep, uh, try to, I try to rank the guests to put a little competition edge in there to make them want to come back and talk more. And <laughs> so. my competitive spirit, here's that. <laughs> yes. Love it. So. Well, Beth, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, have a fantastic rest of the week and, um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk soon. All right. Blessings, Jam. Bye. What a fun conversation. I can't wait to have Beth back in the dojo. Um, it, it was great connecting with her at SBL, and I knew she's somebody that I would want to have here on the channel. So check out her work. I'm going to put links to everything we talked about in the description below. Give it a look. See what's up. Follow her. She's a name to know and is doing some really cool work. And so Disciple Dojo wants to put her on your radar if she's not already. Thanks for watching. Once again, if you haven't already, would love for you to subscribe if you appreciate this episode or any of our other content here on the channel. Our subscribe subscribers and people watching and sharing and, and growing this channel. That's what keeps us going uh, at the most literal level. So thank you to all of you who support Disciple Dojo. That's all for now. So we'll sign off as always. Keep training.